So I'm joined by Becky Holston today. And my first question is one which I always struggle with, Becky, and that is, how do I describe you and what do you do? That's a really good question. Um, because I wear a few hats over the certainly the, the last 12 years that you and I have um, known one another. Um, I actually specialise, you know, through my evolution, I really specialise in stress and anxiety. And, you know, I've spent the last, certainly the last six, seven years learning lots of different ways that um, people can overcome stress and anxiety rather than manage it. You know, we're all hearing stress management, how do I manage things? Actually, I've started to discover lots of different ways that have helped me in my life um, not to manage it, but to actually change the way our whole bodies and nervous systems deal with stress and demands and overwhelm. So stress and anxiety expert, I think, is, is pretty much what the media um, tag me with these days. Which is interesting because I never probably would have said that was, I wouldn't have pigeonholed you as that because I don't see myself as a stressed person or an anxious person. Yet we've worked together for a long time and you've helped me enormously and probably without realizing it, you are helping me be that person who's not stressed and anxious. Mm. What's really interesting, I mean, I'm checking with all my clients over the, you know, the last couple of weeks because, you know, for obvious reasons, whether or not I'm actively seeing them at the moment or not. And the majority of my clients who have originally come to me because they were really stressed or dealing with high levels of anxiety, and a lot are in the small, medium enterprise business market, they're actually doing really well. And by doing really well, I mean, you know, yes, they're having some tears here and there. Yes, they're saying that they're feeling sad, but they're acknowledging how they feel. And then at the same time, um, they're feeling quite resilient um, towards who they need to become to take them and their businesses through this time. So, you know, I think, you know, that's the evidence that really when you start to learn to change how you deal with stress, um, it doesn't matter what goes on in your life you can show up with resilience. So the, the people that you work with, let's say, do they come to you because they say they're stressed or do, does it manifest itself in a different way, maybe? Some will come with, you know, I'm stressed. Yeah. Others will come because they are um, feeling overwhelmed or they're getting angry yeah. or they're frustrated with themselves or perhaps they're drinking too much or perhaps, you know, um they just feel they need some support but perhaps not realizing quite what you know what they're in um often it might be a relationship breakdown generally there's a pain point that somebody comes to me um, i'm not you know in the earlier days i did a lot more leadership stuff which was self-direction and all of those skills still stand today um, i helped a lot of business leaders become better bigger faster perform well and athletes too um, but actually, I started to see that, that where my passion really lied, lies is with driven people where it isn't going well. So yeah. for most of my clients these days, there is a pain point, um, and, and that will be why they come into me. Maybe they're not sleeping, for example, or they're overweight, or um, yeah, generally feeling overwhelmed. So two things there. You said not sleeping, overweight. Um, they're symptoms of or signs of stress that you yes. might not, yeah okay yes. so what other things might people be looking out for it i mean particularly at the moment we're in the midst of unprecedented times words you know we, we yeah. use the word unprecedented so many times in such a short space of time but um what are people finding right now and they, they might not realize they're stressed but they might realize they're not sleeping or they're eating lots more or so it depends how your nervous system responds to being under threat. And it depends on what your relationship is anyway with threat. Generally, when we cope with threat, we don't suddenly change our behavior. If the threat's really big, our numbing technique, so our drinking, our watching TV, our extreme exercise habits, we'll just do more of that because the pain is bigger. So now I need to do more of what takes away the pain so i mean stomach issues too heart palpitations um i've you know quite a few people have been mistaken um 
symptoms of panic for symptoms of coronavirus because they've got a you know chest feels tight um you know their breathing feels restrictive well they're all also symptoms of stress you know stress is isn't just a mental affliction it's a very it's, it's actually more of a physical one um so it is that you know there's many physical symptoms a lot of people have learned to cut themselves off from their feelings so they might not notice that they feel stress for example you know I have, i've worked with a, a lot of um ex-special forces um you know their masters are learning not to feel fear doesn't mean their body isn't right it just means that their brain and their body they've sort of severed that connection and then they wonder why they've got eczema all over their elbows um, so, you know, skin disorders is another big red flag of the way that the body says, I'm, I'm not coping with the amount of the stress hormone cortisol that is whooshing through my body right now. And is it a good thing for someone to not feel those emotions? Um, there's a time and a place. Yeah. We're in, in, if we're in imminent threat, think about the lion, right? This is, you know, most of our responses to danger would be totally correct if a lion was just to jump in the window now. The problem is most of us are reacting to invisible lions. Yeah. And therefore, you know, when we're avoiding things and running away, uh, you know, we're not opening our bills, for example. We're not getting on the phone to call our, all of our bill providers because we're afraid of the confrontation when actually, you know, not being paying a lot of bills at the moment or getting a holiday from that would really help a lot of people right now. Um, but how many aren't picking up the phone because they're afraid of compensation? Now that existed prior to, you know, coronavirus. So our coping mechanisms don't change. If we've got good ones, they'll help carry us through this time. Um, if we haven't built good self-comfort, for example, then things are going to be harder. So you talk about threats. The, the threats are big, and that's where the stress comes from. So we're in the midst of the coronavirus. Life has changed. Mm -hmm. What do you think people are seeing in terms of threats at the moment? What are they perceiving as threats? Well, 99% of people have lost something. So it may be visiting people, it may be financial, business loss, identity loss, loss of freedom, loss of loved ones, loss of connection, loss of identity, loss of status, um, loss of security. You know, we might have money in the bank, but we're worrying about what's gonna happen four months, five months from now, because it's out of our control. And for a lot of people who don't really you know, the, the I just get on with it brigade. That's fine as long as you're in control. The minute you meet something you're not in control, then your whole way of feeling safe in the world crumbles. And then you've got a problem. Yeah, I, I definitely relate to that because I think myself and Paul, business partner, we've always felt like we were in control. We've built a business, we've sort of planned what we've been doing, we, we knew the steps we were taking, and then all of a sudden, felt like overnight everything changes and it was completely out of our control and we also have no control as to when it's going to come back so yeah we uh, i think just like everybody else we're in that same sort of threat stage um is there sort of phases that people go through that you're seeing at the moment of emotional response to this very much so i think the first is shock yeah you now whenever something comes especially suddenly you know, our natural physical way to protect ourselves is to go into shock, you know, and that might be, and, and sometimes you can tell someone's still in shock because they're talking really fast, you know, really talking very fast, not breathing very well. You know, they might seem to get a bit more manic, whereas somebody else's way of dealing with shock is they shut down. Yep. So there's no right or wrong way. It's just how your body works. And you've got to understand how your body works for you personally when you're under threat. Um, so for me, you know, it's fight, flight, freeze. You know, I'm a freeze person. Yep. I just do the stick and set. I'm not here. The danger will pass. You know, that's my way of feeling under threat. But, you know, interesting, you know, some of you in the community have know that, you know, I'm a survivor of cancer. I battled seven tumors. tumors. That was my coronavirus. You know, that was my awakening to not feeling in control of my body 
my life, my future, my business, everything. Any, any dysfunctional relationship I had with control got beaten out of me <laughs> through that process. Yep. So finding myself in a threat situation now, you know, I can see how the skills I've developed through that time and obviously through my professional skills as well um, are really kicking in. Um, and so I'm responding very differently to, to this threat. So somebody new who's not had your experiences, let's say, um, everyone's experiences are different, but someone new to this, they're going to be in that, um, that shock phase. Mm -hmm. Then typically, I mean, I've seen a lot of people um, go into ostrich mode, put head in the sand and uh, hope it all just goes away. Um, what, what can you do to help people in that sort of situation? Well, I mean, what we're talking about here is identifying grief. So after the shock period, you know, it's very hard to make decisions about the future when you're in shock. You know, there's, the, physiologically, there's parts of your brain that shut down that mean, what do I need to do to get safe right now is what's going on. And you need to allow your body to process that. And that may be that, you know, you've come out of shock because you have some tears. Yeah. Right. You don't have tears when you're in shock. So. The grief is what we've all, we've all got to get our head around. And, you know, there's, there's a classic five stages of grief. And these aren't all done in order. You know, the, unfortunately, grief is a bit of a messy business and it doesn't show up in a nice formula that we can all feel in control of because we've been given five stages of grief. Great. I can tick these off and feel in control. Sadly, it doesn't work like that. So part of the levels of grief, um, those five stages of grief is the first one is denial and isolation. Now we're already dealing with isolation. Um, so that might not stand out for some people that they're actually in a stage of grief because they're missing the identification of turning down invitations, not wanting to go to parties, not wanting to go to family things, not wanting to go to networking businesses. All of that's been taken away. So denial and, and isolation. You know, I'm seeing some people in the business community um, who I know are in denial, but they're looking efficient. Right, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do that. But their staff are sitting around and thinking, yeah, but that's not gonna work yeah. because of X, Y, Z. You know, some of the people that are, you know, not all of them, some of them are just, there's a word for it. Um, I'm not gonna say it live, but, some of the people that don't seem to be abiding by the rules, yep. it's not because they are difficult and they don't care. It's because they're in denial. Their way of dealing with all the threats in their lives is to pretend it isn't happening. So that's the ostrich yep. syndrome. The second stage of grief is anger. So in shock and denial, you don't really feel a lot. So if you're feeling quite numb, you're probably somewhere in shock and denial. So I'm bouncing around there. Then there's anger. Now we feel anger. Yeah. But anger is brilliantly designed because one of the purposes of anger, and look, anger takes 90 seconds to flash through our body. But one of the beautiful purposes of anger is to protect us. So when we feel angry, you can't feel loss, which is why a lot of people wait till they're angry to finish a relationship. Right. You know, you didn't put the bins out. That's the end of our 30 year marriage. I'm really angry now. Um, it's because in that moment, they don't feel the grief. So it allows them to express themselves. So anger has an important function in this. You know, if you're being angry at somebody else and you're continuing to be angry, that's abuse. That's different. But expressing your anger and feeling it is is healthy. Um, the, the next stage of grief is bargaining. And there's a lot of people in business, especially right now, who will be going, if I if I'd just done that, then that would have happened. You know, if I'd just taken that insurance out, if I just got rid of got rid of those difficult staff members, if I just streamlined and kept things simple, if if only they begin with the if only. So that's that bargaining stage. And then depression is another you know, the fourth part of the five stages of grief is depression. And even if depression isn't a word you identify with, maybe suppression is. 
So is it fair to say that one can lead to the other? So bargaining, for example, if you do a lot of the, if only I'd done that, that would probably lead me to depression. Yeah, completely. Fast route into depression for those, and, and people who have a tendency for their nervous system to shut down yeah. will go into depression. You know, it's a protective mechanism. Here I am in my safe place where no one can hurt me except me. Yeah. Um, so yes, the, the bargaining can take you to depression because on some way you're leveraging blame. And unless you were in charge of a laboratory in Wuhan, etc., then you are not to blame for this. Yeah. But do, do people beat themselves up for, well, I guess they do. For, for yeah. If only, you know, it's, uh, if only we'd been better prepared, if only we had a backup plan, if only we'd, you know, a diversified. Yeah, if only we'd had that insurance, if only we hadn't taken that building, yeah. if only we hadn't grown, if only we hadn't, you know, the list is ended. If only I had, oh, I should have done this and I should have done that. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have taken themselves to a blame place. Yeah. Um, or they... You know, I think having your own business, you know, and I have my own business too, you, you have to learn to get used to feeling unsafe yep. because you don't get the security that you do, for example, working for government. So you've all, you know, in order to have succeeded in your first year of business on some level, you have already got used to feeling unsafe. Do you, do you think it's possibly fair to say that entrepreneurial people who are self-employed like you and me, we are slightly more used to these conditions of change and um whereas somebody who's employed who has now suddenly found themselves furloughed or um sat at home with nothing to do um could be getting more stressed because they they haven't developed the skills that a self-employed person may have sort of developed yeah absolutely it goes it goes on your relationship with the world um, which is nothing to do with coronavirus. That's just an amplifier to it. Yeah. And that is about how safe you feel in the world and how you trust people and how you trust others and your level of certainty versus uncertainty that you require to feel most comfortable. So for example, um, you know, if you took, you know, you and I are both entrepreneurial minded. If we imagined ourselves right now to be in a world where we had 100% certainty, we knew everything that was going to be happening, you know, almost, you know, psychic ability that everything was going to happen. Now, right now, that sounds like that would be great for a couple of months, right? But how's that looking a year from now? Yeah. Really bad, right? Suddenly you and I both like go, hmm, not so much. So if you then move the marker back from 100% and find your normal operating, and I'd say normally for me, I'd say I like... I mean, I used to like a lot more, you know, insecurity than I do now, but I'd say I probably like about 60% and about 40% uncertainty. Yeah. You know, that's where I thrive both. If I've got 80% um, certainty and 20% uh, uncertainty, yeah, feels a bit boring. So work out what is your normal need for um, security. In the same way, when I work with people from government organizations and I ask them that question, most of them will come out with about, they'll need about 80%, 80-90% security and 10, sorry, certainty and 10% uncertainty. And that's potentially being flipped on its head right now. Completely, yeah. So do, do people, when they're going through these phases of grief, do, do they notice it, do you think? No. I think one of the things sometimes when we're in something we're experiencing we don't we we don't know until we come out of it oh yeah you know of course i felt that way um no but i think to be aware of it and sometimes you just know in your gut when you find a piece of information like you connect with the fact that you're grieving yeah i am grieving you know there's such thing as a bodiless death yeah and i think you know, some of us are losing things we need to lose. You know, we're losing negative habits. We're losing um, not taking care of ourselves. We're losing things that we were thought were important to us. And we're finding a whole new experience of things that really are important to us. So there's a big, you know, this puts any challenge like this puts a massive microscope and a spotlight 
on everything you do think and feel. So I've got some more questions around that. Was that all five? Did I miss one? Yeah, so let me just highlight that. So we've got denial yep. and I obviously shock is separate. So yep. shock is where we go first of all. Then we go into denial and isolation. And then number two, anger. Yep. Number three, bargaining. Yep. Number four, depression. And then that brings us on to a much nicer place to feel, which is acceptance. And what does it take to get there? Because that's the it one. Take letting go. Right. It's surrendering and letting go of the right things. You know, there's a great prayer by Francis of Assisi. Um, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And, you know, the, you know just those words as a poem, look at it as a poem. Yep. Um, I think that, it, I think everyone should have that on their walls right now, just to help them go, hang on a minute. Am I trying to change something I can't? Well, yeah. Well, in which case you're waiting for a ferry at an airport. And am I really getting in, in charge of the things I can change? And if I'm not, what can I do? Yeah. So it's starting to help yourself go from a diff, an unresourceful place to a resourceful place. I think the mistake people make often is they try and change something from an unresourceful place emotional state you know i'm really angry i'm going to change everything you know when emotions are high intelligence is low yeah. yeah so i know you're going to help us by teaching us a little technique in a little bit to deal with the resilience build some resilience into your life um, yeah. before we come on to that um we were talking a little bit earlier about um the effects it can have on the, the coronavirus, um, not the actual virus itself, but the effect of um, our change of life is having on us and how this can actually increase stress levels potentially um, because of our, our sudden changes of life. For example, my wife and I, you know, normally we lead uh, very busy lives separately and come together evenings and weekends and all of a sudden we are crammed into our, our flat, um, nice flat, but we've never spent so much time together and I'm sure well, I'm de we're definitely not alone in this, this concept mm. that has an impact as well. It's as well, doesn't it? So it's not just the stress of work and or, or lack of work. It's the sudden change of lifestyle that's having a big impact. Yeah, very much. And, and a sense of losing freedom, you know, space, um, balance you know and then put children in the mix as well you know people are trying to now manage being the teacher being the business owner being the mum and dad being you know being the dinner lady going to the shops which isn't as easy as it used to be and 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 then caring and worrying about people too so suddenly we're having to manage a lot um and i think it's, it's really i think that the main thing is to understand, and, and most people don't really understand what stress is. So if you don't understand what something is, how can you do anything about that? And I think one of the traps that we've fallen into in modern life, coronavirus aside, is that stress is a nervous system response yep. that then brings out some mental health conditions, right? So it is about learning how to biohack your body so it is able to deal with pressure effectively so that you can keep yourself resourceful um, you know so for example one of the things that i've done to um and you know i've seen lots of other people doing too you know my self-care is pretty good anyway i would say um, you know i've worked hard to get there it wasn't always the case that's been my evolution too i can't help the amount of people i help if i'm not full up i learned that one early on in my business career and i think most people hit that year two in their business as well um, but you know how many people have improved their well-being toolkit you know i have now a, a system that i religiously do come rain come shine every single morning which is above and beyond what I was doing before. And now I'm thinking, why wasn't I doing that anyway? So is it fair to say then that we should really all be working harder than we've ever worked on ourselves in this time of need? Because 
if we if we don't we're in danger of impacting others that impacting us so for example you know you might be stressed about your work and thinking well you know that's separate to my social life my family life but actually if you're not careful it'll spill over into the other then you start falling out with your partners that then impacts on everything else and it becomes a vicious spiral and stress just builds up even more completely yeah and divorce is expensive and gratitude is free yep. so you know actually it's so it's very easy to, you know, when everyone's, when you're, when you're stressed, emotions are high, intelligence is low. It's very easy to just see what someone isn't doing and not see what they are doing. Yeah. So if you're in that position, same with staff as well. Um, it's just to take a moment and actually relook at what is going, you know, what is the truth here? And, you know, how can, ask yourself, it's about becoming your own coach. You know, it's about saying, how can I connect better with myself and how can I connect better with others around me? Yeah. And what you'll find is if you're doing it well, it, it, it's minutes. You don't need three hours to connect better. You need minutes of just being present with someone. Put the phone down, put the tech down, even if it's just for five minutes over breakfast um, and start to create better habits. But, it, but first of all, we've got to get out of that trap of saying, I'm stressed because. Sure, it's really important to acknowledge your feelings. If you're feeling sad, label it. That's how you set yourself free. You set yourself free by making friends with those emotions, whether or not they're negative or positive, rather than just stuffing them down. Um, but under, understanding that, okay, so I'm feeling stressed. How can I change my state? So for example, when I was going through cancer, there was nothing that I was doing that was going to change what I was experiencing. There was nothing that was going to change the threat to my health, the threat to my life, the threat to my future, the threat to my business, all sounding quite familiar to lots of people at the moment. But what I learned is that you can change how you feel. And that wasn't by cutting myself off and pretending everything's fine, that great British saying, I'm fine, not breathing, not blinking, but I'm fine. Um, a lot of people running around like that at the moment. Yeah. But it's starting to learn that stress is how your nervous system responds when the demands on it are greater than the resources that you have. So one way to overcome that is to build greater resources. And so this technique starts to help you to, on your journey to building greater resources. So one more thing then before we come on to that, is it fair to say that um, if you are stressed, that does have an impact on your immune system and there's, you know, it's not a coincidence that people who are more stressed tend to get sicker? Yeah, the first, so, you know, the first thing that gets hit is your prefrontal cortex here. That shuts down. Yep. That's, that is your ability to spot errors um, and to um, some emotional processing. And then the next thing to go is your immune system. So another way of helping yourself to be a healthy mind and body and robust is, is, is as well to, to get rid of stress. And, and a really good way to get rid of stress is breathing. Yeah. Available to all. So we don't breathe. So we... You know, I sit often with clients and their shoulders do not move for like an hour. And I'm thinking, how are you still alive? Because they're doing really shallow breaths. You suddenly become uh, self-conscious of my shoulders. Right, yeah. Everyone does like, oh my God, she's looking. Um, and so a really good way to trick and biohack your nervous system into a sense of calm, even in chaos. And that's what we're talking about now is how do I create calm in chaos? How do I get in the middle of a storm when a hurricane moves through? There's that peaceful part. And I mean, utter destruction on the outside. And then there's that stillness in the middle, isn't it? Yeah. So it's about looking at how do I stay in the middle of that storm? And the way to do that is to bio, learn to biohack your nervous system. So breathing is the easiest and available to all way to biohack your nervous system. So when you breathe, you've got two um well, it's a lot more complex than this, but essentially two nervous systems, right? Your sympathetic nervous system, which is your accelerator, yeah. and your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your brake. Now, we need these two to work together. But if you're stressed, 
that one gets stuck on. Yeah, yeah. So a very good way to create calm is to force your parasympathetic nervous system to switch in. You know, why is it that some people do presenting and public speaking and they're genuinely really calm? And for another person, the sympathetic nervous system is stuck on. Okay, so this is about learning to biohack your nervous system. So a good breathing technique to do is to breathe in for the count of four, which we can do now. So yep. hold for the count of four and out for the count of four. So we do that again, in for the count of four. Hold for the count of four. And out for the count of four. So that's just one of many techniques. And go onto YouTube, look at breathing techniques for stress. There's some different ones and find ways that work. And straight away, like, you know, I can see that you just created a bit more calm. So that is the number one way to biohack your nervous system into calm. Brilliant. Everyone can do that straight away. Yeah, and it will make you think, how on earth am I breathing ordinarily? <laughs> so that's a really good way and to keep your immune system boosted as well. Okay, fantastic. So does this lead us nicely into the technique you're going to be talking about? For sure. So to build upon that, yep. this is also a really good technique. I use this um, with clients um, and everyone can use it at home. Um, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with. This is a good way of sort of pushing your whole nervous system back into the re rest and relax nervous system, you know, even in, your, in the middle of chaos. So the first thing, if we're ready to do that, is it's important that you're not driving when you try this or operating any heavy machinery or anything like that. You will need to just be sat um, somewhere calm and quiet. So if that's not you right now, yep. um, perhaps just you know, come back to this segment. But if that is you right now, what I'd like you to do is to, eyes open or eyes closed, whichever is comfortable for you, just ask your unconscious mind to go back through your lifetime and find a memory where you felt totally safe. So we're not looking for happy, we're not looking for peaceful, we're looking for totally safe. Chances are if you felt peaceful in this memory, you were feeling safe. Ideally, we want a memory where it's just you. But if you don't have that, that's okay too. Now for some of you that have just gone looking for a memory, some of you may have found that you don't have one. And that's okay. For some people who experienced um, some, you know, childhood issues, uh, it might have been a long, long, long time ago where they actually really felt safe or had a safe memory. And if that's you too, it's a really quite a big discovery to discover that you don't have that safe memory. And if that's you, it's okay if you can't remember all the pieces either, or if you're not sure if the details were correct, you can use your imagination. And if you really don't have a memory where you felt totally safe, then all you need to do is um, create one. Perhaps there was a picture you saw in a holiday brochure or um, a memory that's, you know, that you've seen on television or just one you've constructed in your imagination. It really doesn't matter. But if you've got a real one, then that's ideal. So once you've got that memory, have you got a memory? Yes, I do, yeah. Great. So once you've got that memory, what I'd like you to do is just um, be sitting down, ideally, obviously not in this situation, and then just cross your arms. So your hands are just below the tops of your shoulders. That's right. And then with eyes closed, um, just start to gently tap rhythmically on alternate hands on each side. That's it. And just find a pace that feels right for you. That's right. So keep just tapping gently on that shoulder, on those shoulders all the way through. And what I'd like you to do is recall that memory where you felt totally safe. And as you recall this memory, 
of feeling totally safe. So that you're looking through your own eyes, seeing what you're seeing, hearing what you're hearing, and feel the feelings of feeling totally safe. If there are any colours that are important, bring those colours in. If there are any smells that are important, bring those smells in. If there are any sounds that are important, just turn up and sharpen the sounds. Make this the most compelling for you. As you experience this memory of feeling totally safe, And as you experience this memory of feeling totally safe, I'd like to ask your unconscious mind to take this memory and pass it to every cell in your body so that every cell in your body has this memory of feeling totally safe. That's right. Creating a chain reaction from the top of your head all the way the tips of your tongue. As you see what you see, hear what you hear, and feel the feeling of feeling totally safe. And then what I'd like you to do when you're ready is come gently back to now, but bring the feelings of safe with you. And then when you're ready, come all the way back into the room, into now, and just gently start to open your eyes. Okay, and then just relax that tapping. How does that feel? Amazing. So simple, but yeah, very relaxed and stress-free. So again, that is a really simple way to biohack. And once you've got that memory, you don't have to stick to just the one memory. You can have some different ones if you don't know what to choose. Um, you know, you can anytime just sit and visit that memory and tap your shoulders and your nervous system will remember this and take you back to that feeling and say, Brilliant. So anytime you, you feel the need, you can just do this and even don't wait to feel the need. Do it every day. Yeah. Great. Most of us have had a bit of a fractured relationship with safe. And what you'll find is it's very hard to be happy if you don't feel safe. So make yourself feel safe first and then make yourself feel happy. Brilliant. Does that help? Amazing. Yeah, it absolutely does. So simple, but very effective. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. So that was amazing. I know you've offered to help us with another session as well. Um, just talk a little bit about what that's going to look like, um, because I, I know you, you've helped us in the business before doing this session, and it w went down unbelievably well. So uh, what can people expect to see with what you're going to be doing next for us? So what I'm going to be doing next is I'm going to be taking you through a mini workshop on building resilience. So this will be um, pen and paper to hand. Anyone attending that is going to be doing some work. I'm going to be asking them some questions. They're going to be doing a lot of writing. It, it, essentially, it's an, it's an online webinar um, where you can learn how to build better resilience, um, which, you know, again, that is the answer to, that's life mastery, isn't it? Brilliant. Life mastery isn't pretending things aren't happening. Life mastery is acknowledging where you're at and finding your resources to get through wherever you find yourself in life. Excellent. So we'll be posting details about that session uh, in due course. So we'll um, get that out to everybody. In the meantime, if anyone would like to, to learn a little bit more about you, Becky, how can they find you? Yeah, certainly they can find me through my website, which is www.becky, B-E-C-K-I, Holston, H-O-U-L-S-T-O-N, um, dot com. 
And, you know, if you've got any questions, you can drop me an email or give me a call. I'm working with people online all over the world um, and supporting them as always. Um, you know, my big question is, how can, you know, how can I help you? Brilliant. And I guess my sort of final takeaway is I've worked with you for years and our, what we've done together has evolved over the years as well. And I will now talk to you before I need to talk to you, I mm. guess. And that's, I'm guessing the same for a lot of the people you work with. Uh, I'll pick entrepreneurs, let's say, but um, they probably recognize as a little bit like a, uh, a golf golfer who has a coach. It could be a world famous golfer, but still has a coach to help them identify how to make improvements. And they, they have that coach before they even need the coach or before they realize they need help and support um, to keep them on their A game. And that's part of what, this is, I guess, is to keep you on your A game so that you can function normally and, and to the best of your ability. Is that fair to say? 100%. You know, as I said, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, um, many of my clients I've been working with over an intense period of time, you know, in, in this time where everyone's feeling, you know, 99% of people have lost something, they're actually doing really well. Yeah. And they're surprising themselves. They're like, I don't understand how I'm feeling so calm and I'm feeling all right, actually. And I'm seeing the opportunities and I'm, I, I don't understand it. And I'm like, that's because you've done the work. Yeah. And I guess um, talking and sharing is very important at this time. And um, I'm not a talker. I'm a naturally quiet person. But myself and Paul, my business partner, we talk multiple times throughout the day. Um, we're also very conscious to talk to our teams. We have a, a daily 8.30 briefing with our corporate team. We have a four o'clock with our franchisees. And we're just trying to engage people because I guess now more than ever is an important time to be talking and sharing. One of the best ways to deal with people who are feeling unsafe is community. Yep. We may not be able to you know, and from a nervous system perspective, I'm talking as well, not just from the human connection point, is that if we feel unsafe about something, the best thing is that community. I call it the dream team. I've got my dream team um, and, you know, and I've got my support team. Um, a lot of people struggle to ask for help anyway, um, or they, help, they only ask for help when they're on their knees because they're afraid of looking weak. Well, you know, you need to throw that away right now. Um, you know the smart people in town what they're doing is they're embracing that vulnerability and it'll be the greatest strength that we rebuild everything on brilliant so you've been amazing today becky thank you very much we'll be posting your contact details um on uh, with this uh, recording so thank you very much with this podcast um, and we look forward to the next session well it's lovely to lovely to to work with you steve brilliant thanks becky take care